the Ukraine to sort of sort it out between themselves and, and the Russians? Whatever happens, happens. Well, well, certainly in the United States, I speak uh, uh, more from the perspective of the United States taxpayers, and it doesn't serve our interests. We've already spent $5 billion over the last 10 years trying to pick and choose the leadership of Ukraine. And then we participated in the overthrow of the uh, Yanukovych government. And this is when this recent stuff really stirred up. But we've been involved too much, and I take a non-interventionist foreign policy position. It's not our business. It doesn't serve anybody's interests. It's part of the same thing that led us into the disaster in the Middle East. A lot of people die, a lot of money is spent, and we're still suffering the consequences of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's the threat of the war in Syria. We don't need another threat. The American taxpayers don't want it. And they, our government thinks they can get away with, well, I know the people don't want a war yet, but we're going to play games and we're going to threaten Russia and we're going to put on sanctions. And they fail to recognize that we have $500 billion of investments in Russia. Russia has $450 billion invested in the West. And all we're doing is trying to stir up more trouble. It makes no sense whatsoever. So, so it makes a lot of sense for us to mind our own business and let somebody over there solve their own problem. So this Ron Paul was right. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go? If there's any American politician that you can just flat out take their word for it, it would be the great Dr. Ron Paul. But for those that aren't such huge fans of his who don't know his track record, who haven't seen all of the times that he's been proven right, even when he was called a quack, a loon, no one believed what he had to say. It was just too far-fetched. And then five, ten years, sometimes months later, he's proven to be exactly right. Well, unfortunately, in 2014 which is what that interview was from, Dr. Ron Paul was once again right. But I don't want you to take his word for it or mine. So I have sought out to prove exactly what has transpired to get us where we are today on the verge of potential world war and the potential of nuclear conflict, which is world ending. So I think it's very important that we know the facts, that we know the truth, that we at least have some operating thesis from which we can assess what we are doing now and what we might be doing moving forward and what we ought to be doing moving forward. So this is kind of a, a counter narrative attempt on my part to hopefully deliver you some facts about what has occurred as opposed to narrative. And, you know, I have my own opinions here, but I'm going to try and set them aside as much as possible and allow the evidence to speak for itself. I think most likely what you'll conclude by the end is we have been lied to in a very deep way. And that's not to say that I don't have my own semi-firm conclusions as to what's transpired, but more than anything, I just want people to open their mind to the possibility that this is a much more complicated issue than we have been told. And I think that it's really important that the average person be allowed to formulate their own opinion on these things. And I know a lot of people don't have time. So instead of expecting you to go out and do all the reading I've done, I put together a really truncated, concise version of events in hopes that it allow you to make your own assessment and decide if you think that we should be providing endless, infinite support, both monetarily, militarily, uh, training, everything else like we've been doing in Ukraine for a very long time, as I will prove, and uh, if that makes sense to you. That's all I want. I just want you guys to think. I want you to decide for yourselves. And if you come to the conclusion that none of this information dissuades you, that's fine. Uh, that's your your cross to bear if we end up in a nuclear war, I'll say that. Uh, but ultimately, it is your choice. So uh, enjoy. I hope that it's educational. And more than anything, I hope that people will, will share this around to those that perhaps have been asking questions but don't have the answers, don't have the time to do it on their own. I'm going to try and give you an hour breakdown of everything that you'll need to know to make your own conclusion. Enjoy. So I think probably the most concise breakdown of the at least the 2014 period up until now was done by Aaron Matei. And he's hardcore anti-war guy. So once again, take it with a grain of salt. I'm going to prove out as much of this as I can so you can actually decide if you believe what he has to say. 
I have concluded that he is telling as close to the truth as anyone I have read. So take that for what it's worth. Here we go. This piece is on his sub stack. If you guys want to check, check that out, I have to read some of it. I'm going to give you video and audio to give further evidence that some of his claims are accurate. Ukraine is the biggest prize. In the United States, the Russian invasion is widely portrayed as a campaign by Putin to colonize Ukraine and subvert its efforts to join the European Union. If that is indeed Putin's goal now, then he is doing so only after a years-long effort led by the U.S. to force the deeply divided country into the Western orbit. By its own accounting, the U.S. has spent $5 billion on this crusade since 1991, which is what we just heard Ron Paul say in that clip from 2014 complemented with tens of millions more from the European Union. The U.S. agenda was made plain in September 2013 when Carl Gershman, head of the CIA-tied National Endowment for Democracy, declared that Ukraine is the biggest prize. If Ukraine could be pulled into the U.S.-led order, Gershman explained, Putin may find himself on the losing end, not just in the near abroad, but within Russia itself. In short, in Washington's eyes, regime change in Kiev could redound to Moscow as well basically an extrapolation of the Cold War and an effort to oust Putin. I'm not really certain as to why, but we'll, I think you can come to your own conclusions. An opportunity to claim the prize arrived two months later with the outbreak of Ukraine's Maidan protests. The Maidan is commonly described in the U.S. as a democratic revolution. That is a fair term for its initial weeks, when tens of thousands of Ukrainians gathered in Kiev's Maidan Square to protest rampant government corruption and to support European integration. But these protests were soon co-opted by Ukraine's far-right forces, who turned a people's movement into a violent campaign for, for, for regime change. Maidan culminated in what George Friedman, head of the U.S. intelligence-tied firm Stratfor, reportedly described as, quote, the most blatant coup in history, end quote. The spark for the Maidan protest was a decision by President Viktor Yanukovych to back out of a trade deal offered by the European Union. The conventional narrative is that Yanukovych was bullied by his chief patron in Moscow. In reality, Yanukovych was hoping to develop ties to Europe and cajoled and bullied anyone who pushed for Ukraine to have closer ties to Russia, Reuters reported at the time. But the Ukrainian president got cold feet once he read the EU's deal, EU deal's fine print. Ukraine would not only have to curb its deep deep cultural and economic ties to Russia, but accept harsh austerity measures such as increasing the retirement age and freezing pensions and wages. Far from improving the lives of average UK Ukrainians, these demands only would have ensured deprivation and Yanukovych's political demise. Russia capitalized on Yanukovych's jitters by offering a more generous package of $15 billion and threatening to withhold payment if the EU's, if the EU's terms were accepted. Unlike its Western counterparts, Russia also did not demand that Ukraine abandon its European ambitions. Yanukovych, the Times reported in December 2013, has insisted that Ukraine would ultimately move toward Europe and even consider signing the accords at a later date. But there was one obstacle. A senior European Union official has said those discussions have been cut off. By that point, rather than help broker a compromise, the U.S. had swung its weight behind far-right opposition figures who had taken command of the Maidan. As far-right groups occupied government buildings across Ukraine, Washington's bipartisan cold warrior swept in to claim the prize. Senator John McCain and Chris Murphy visited the central protest encampment in Kiev and stood behind Oleg Tanibruk, leader of the far-right Svoboda party. Tanibruk had once urged his supporters to fight the Muscovite Jewish mafia running Ukraine, end quote. Ukraine will make Europe better and Europe will make Ukraine better, McCain promised the crowd, giving away the game. Murphy told CNN that the senator's mission was to, quote, bring about a peaceful transition here, end quote. Sounds a little cooish to me. The senators were joined in Kiev by senior State Department official Victoria Newland. We'll get an audio clip from her later proving all of this out who now occupies a similar position under Biden. On February 4th, an intercepted phone call, presumably recorded and released by Russian or U Ukrainian intelligence, exposed Newland's plan for bringing the transition about. Speaking to Jeffrey Payat, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Newland laid out how the U.S. would back a new Ukrainian government fronted by Maidan leaders and handpicked by Washington. The State Department responded to the leak by dismissing, dismissing it as Russian tradecraft. Oh, where have we heard that before? Russian tradecraft, huh? Huh? Do you remember? Hunter Biden's laptop, ring a bell. Here we go. This is Victoria Newland with Jeffrey Pyatt. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, 
the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. Yats is Yats and Yuk, who coincidentally becomes the next leader of Ukraine. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Kleech and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. You know, I, I, I just think Kleech going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk, it's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay, good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, Klitschko has been the top dog, he's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And again, the fact that this is out there right now I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to. Um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other, the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. Right. Thanks. Although Newland had cavorted along with McCain and Murphy with Tony Brook in Maidan Square, the fascist leader was deemed unsuitable for office. The anti-Semitic Russophobe Newland worried would be a problem and better on the outside. Also discussed was former boxer and opposition figure Vitaly Klitschko, one of my favorite fighters ever, by the way. But he was quickly ruled out. I don't think Klitsch should go into government, Newland said. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. One reason was Klitschko's proximity to the European Union. Despite McCain's warm words for the EU before the Maidan crowd, the Europeans had annoyed Washington by supporting a compromise proposal that would leave Yanukovych in power. As Newland put it to Payat, fuck the EU. The two US, the two US officials settled on technocrat Arseny Yatsenyuk. Yats is the guy. 
Newland decreed. The only outstanding matter was securing the blessing of the then Vice President Joe Biden and his then senior advisor, Jake Sullivan, for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. Deets being details. The deets were realized days later. On February 20th, snipers fatally shot dozens of protesters in Maidan Square. The massacre was blamed on Yanukovych's forces, setting off a new round of violence and threats on Yanukovych's life. In another intercepted phone call that emerged weeks later, Estonian Foreign Minister Ermas Payet told EU Foreign Secretary Catherine Ashton that he suspected pro-Maidan forces of culpability. In Kiev, Payet reported, there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind the snipers, it was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new opposition coalition, aka false flag type stuff. The University of Ottawa's Ivan uh, Kachinovsky, who had conducted exhaustive research on the massacre, concurs with Pyatt's initial suspicion. The attack, he, the attack, he concludes, was perpetrated principally by members of the Maidan opposition, specifically its far-right elements. On February 21st, a European brokered compromise agreement between Yanukovych and the opposition called for the formation of a new coalition government and early elections. Yanukovych's security forces immediately withdrew from the Maidan area but the encampment's far-right base had no interest in compromise. We don't want to see Yanukovych in power, Maidan squadron leader Vladimir Paryasyuk declared, and unless this morning you come up with a statement demanding that he steps down, then we will take arms and go, I swear, end quote. Yanukovych, no longer protected by his armed forces and under heavy threat, got the message and fled to Russia. A new government was quickly formed despite lacking the sufficient parliamentary majority. This violation of Ukrainian law was of little consequence with the Newland anointed Yatsenyuk named Ukraine's new prime minister. The United States got their guy. So now we have another audio clip. This is uh, Yevon Karas, the leader of Ukraine's neo-Nazi terror gang. C-14 speech from Kiev earlier this month, straight from the horse's mouth. He dispels the many, uh, the many narratives pushed by the left, the mainstream media, and the State Department. Because this gentleman speaks Ukrainian, I am going to keep the audio low and translate for you. We were now been given so much weaponry, not because, as some say, West is helping us, not because they want the best for us, but because we perform the tasks set by the West, because we are the only ones who are ready, because we have fun, we have fun killing, and we have fun fighting. And they like, wow, let's see what's going to happen. And that is the reason for the new alliance, Turkey, Poland, Britain, and Ukraine. We are the flagmen here, because we have started a war that has not been seen for 60 years. So, imagine how many weapons we have, how many veterans we have. And now imagine Russia falls apart, turns into five different Russias or whatever. We have the most javelins on the European continent. Maybe only the UK has more. This potential of these armed forces will immediately become a problem for all those who are now trying to give us problems. It is our joy and our sorrow. You need to understand why. Yes, it is hard, not because we are Ukrainians, our ass has suffered for 300 years. Why finally everything good, not just given to us, we such a good people, we want to join Europe. No, we are a huge powerful state, and if we come to power, it will be both joy and problems for the whole world. Therefore, it is a huge ambitious task. We live in a very cool time. And that is why there is an extremely ambitious cool goal, not just because a part of a European family that has already collapsed. This is about new political alliances on the global level, new political challenges. Maidan was the victory of the nationalist ideas. Nationalists were the key factor there, and clearly at the front lines. Now there is a lot of speculation saying, well, there were Nazis. LGBT and foreign embassies saying there were not much neo-Nazis on Maidan, maybe about 10% of real, real ideological ones. The thing is that such a thing can say only a moron. And don't understand that those 10%, maybe even less, 8%, but how much they are much more effective in the proportion of influence, how much their effectiveness was endless. If not for those 8% of neo-Nazis, the effectiveness of Maidan would have dropped by 90, 80%. So it's the numbers, is not the point. Like now some left-wingers like Boel Foundation and so on trying to count numbers, saying something like there were that many nationalists, they had that much influence. influence. If not for nationalists, that whole thing would have turned into a gay parade. From the horse's mouth, essentially, he's saying, if not for the hard right Nazi forces in Maidan, that revolution, that coup would have never occurred. And those forces were not just armed, but backed and essentially endorsed by Western leadership, including John McCain. May God rest his soul. Hey guys, today I want to tell you about an opportunity to jump headfirst into the Liberty Movement and make a real impact. And good Lord, do we need you right now. 
Young Americans for Liberty is currently recruiting campaign field staff to help elect pro-liberty candidates across the country. These hardcore candidates are dedicated to fighting for federal gun nullification, defend the guard, and criminal justice reform, and many other hardcore liberty policies. If you're ready to be a part of the fight, stand against the establishment and make a real change in 2022, you can join one of these campaigns from now through November 8th. Time is running out. Gas is completely covered, housing is fully provided, and you will be compensated at a total of $2,800 a month for your work on the campaign trail. Plus, you get to meet a lot of great people and really see the inner workings of the political establishment. If you're a young person who's looking for an opportunity and you share in some of my passions, I think this will be a good thing to look into. Go to yaliberty.org forward slash Liberty Lock Pod to apply and make a real change in this country today. The link will be in the description so you guys can not have to memorize all that. Again, yaliberty.org forward slash Liberty Lock Pod. Continuing with the article, overcoming the main obstacle. By backing a far right coup in Kiev, the US overcame the inconvenient hurdle of Ukrainian popular opinion. Summarizing contemporaneous polls days before the February 2014 coup, political scientists Keith Darden and Luke and Wei observed in the Washington Post that none show a significant majority of the population supporting the protest movement and several show a majority opposed. The most accurate survey shows the population almost perfectly divided in its support for the protest, 48% in favor, 46% opposed. This is in reference to the Maidan protests. Despite being the target of the Maidan protests and deeply corrupt, Yanukovych is still apparently the most popular political figure in the country, they added. The Ukrainian population's division over the Maidan protests also extended to the issue that helped spark it, Yanukovych's rejection of a trade deal with the European Union. According to Darden and Wei, there is little evidence that a clear majority of Ukrainians support integration into the European Union, with most polls showing around 40 to 45 percent support, for European integration as compared to about 30 to 40% support for the Russian-led customs union, a plurality for Europe, but hardly a clear mandate. The same could be said for members membership in NATO. The main obstacle to Ukraine's ascension to the alliance, F. Stephen Larrabee, a former Soviet specialist on the U.S. National Security Council, wrote in 2011, is not Russian opposition, but low public support for membership in Ukraine itself. Ukrainian support for joining NATO is much lower in Ukraine in comparison to other states in Eastern Europe. He added at just 22 to 25 percent overall. A Gallup poll released in March 2014 found that more Ukrainians saw NATO as a threat than as offering protection. Sounds wise to me. Although that trend has reversed since Ukrainian support for NATO has increased to barely above 50 percent in polls that exclude the 3.8 million residents of rebel-held Donetsk and Luhansk. In other words, it's only you only get a majority that supports Ukraine becoming a NATO member if you exclude the people who have been getting shelled for eight years now. <laughs> so that's not exactly a fair poll. Continuing on, Yatsenyuk, the Newland chosen technocrat, meanwhile presided over what NPR dubbed Ukraine's spring of austerity and what the prime minister himself described as a kamikaze mission, imposing the pension and heating subsidy cuts that the ousted Yanukovych had resisted. While placating the IMF austerity regime, the coup government also set its sights on Ukraine's ethnic Russian population, a major base of Yanukovych's support. One of the post-coup parliament's first votes was to rescind a law long bitterly opposed by the far right granting regions the authority to declare a second official language. What language do you think that they opposed? I think you can guess. Continuing on, the coup government's anti-Russian sentiment culminated in a gruesome massacre in the city of Odessa. On May 2nd, a right-wing mob assaulted an anti-Maidan emplacement there, forcing the protesters in a nearby trade union building. Trapped inside, the anti-Maidan protesters were burned alive. Those trying to escape the flames were brutally assaulted. The official state toll is 48 dead, but the actual number may be far higher. No credible investigation has ever been conducted. That might be related to the presence of Pera B, who had traveled to Odessa to confront the anti-Maidan camp with hundreds of right sector members in tow. The Odessa massacre helped accelerate the then growing insurgency in the Donbass region, the eastern Ukrainian region dominated by ethnic Russians. Unwilling to live under a U.S. installed coup government led by far right nationalists, Rebels in Donetsk and Luhansk took up arms in the spring of 2014 with Russia's limited support. The U.S.-backed government's government responded with both economic warfare and a Nazi-infused anti-terrorist operation. 
The U.S. Beck Yatsenyuk, by then well-versed in Washington-friendly neoliberal austerity, decreed that all residents of rebel-held Donbass would lose their public sector payments and pensions. Among those fighting the rebels, the New York Times quickly acknowledged in June July 2015, were the openly neo-Nazi Azov Battalion, as well as an assortment of right-wing and Islamic militias summoned from Chechnya. According to Ukraine's Interior Ministry, Azov was among the first battalions to receive U.S. military training for the war. I will also prove out that claim in a later article. The war in Donbass has since left over 14,000 dead. According to UN figures, 81% of the civilian casualties since 2018 have occurred on the rebel-held pro-Russian side. And you wonder why, when given the chance to vote, they vote so prominently to become part of Russia and to leave Ukraine. These Russian-speaking Ukrainians, however, are what Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman described in Manufacturing Consent as unworthy victims. Foreign civilians killed with U.S. support and thus unworthy of our sympathy or even attention. In fact, this is me talking, not the article. In fact, not even people that we can talk about. And if you do talk about it, you're a pro-Russian sympathizing, you know, Nazi or whatever. Continuing on, no matter how deeply entrenched in the United States political establishment and media, no amount of whitewashing surrounding the 2014 coup and its aftermath can negate the reality that for millions of people in Donbass, the war in Ukraine did not start with Putin's invasion last month. This includes the use of illegal cluster munitions, allegedly by both Russia today and the Ukrainian military in 2014, to much different global reactions. Rather than end the proxy war that it helped start in Ukraine, the U.S. has only fueled it over the last eight years with billions in weapons that drive to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, an expansion of U.S. offensive weapons around Russia, and a rejection of dip diplomatic solutions. Shout out to Aaron Matei for that piece. Absolutely tremendous. Quick uh, interlude where we get the great Adam Schiff, <laughs> Shifty Schiff, talking during Trump's first impeachment hearing about why we are supporting Ukraine. This was years ago, mind you. Check this out. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. Interesting, huh? Said that like four years ago, long before Russia had invaded. So we were aiding Ukraine so that we could fight Russia over there so we didn't have to fight them here these people have wanted this for a very long time I, I don't know how you can read it any differently and there's many reasons as to why that they may have wanted it and i'm going to prove that out too here's a quick interlude from anthony blinken in january of this year before russia had invaded where he makes quite explicit that the door to joining nato for ukraine remains open Russian Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov and I met to discuss the crisis instigated by Russia's military buildup on Ukraine's borders and steps to de-escalate tensions and pursue diplomacy. Uh, Russia had previously outlined its concerns and proposals in writing, and last week I told Foreign Minister Lavrov that the United States would do the same. Today, Ambassador Sullivan delivered our written response in Moscow. There are core principles that we are committed to uphold and defend including Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and the right of states to choose their own security arrangements and alliances. We're not releasing the document publicly because we think that diplomacy has the best chance to succeed if we provide space for confidential talks. We hope and expect that Russia will have the same view and will take our proposal seriously. I expect to speak to Foreign Minister Lavrov in the coming days after Moscow has had a chance to read the paper and is ready to discuss next steps. Without going to the specifics uh, of the document, I can tell you that it reiterates what we said uh, publicly uh, for many weeks <laughs> and in a sense for many, uh, many years, uh, that um, we will uphold the principle of NATO's uh, open door. There is no what, change in the, the, in, the, in the U.S. There, there, and NATO position in this document. That for, first of all, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is no change. There will be no change. Second, we reiterate the, that principle. Uh, of course, it is for NATO, uh, not the United States unilaterally, to um, discuss uh, the, uh, the, open door, the open door policy. These are decisions that NATO makes as an alliance, not the United States un uh, unilaterally. But from our perspective, uh, I, I can't be more clear. Uh, NATO's door is open, remains open, 
uh, and uh, that is our commitment. So you might be asking yourself, why is NATO such a big deal, Clint? Well, other than the fact that for, I don't know, 20 plus years, Russian leadership has been loudly declaring that the inclusion of Ukraine into NATO is a red line for them, that they will not allow it. And I think if you separate any propaganda you're already suffering and you just think about this rationally for a second, imagine, say, China had its own defense alliance and they wanted to add, uh, along with whatever other Eastern countries are part of it, they wanted to add Mexico to their defense alliance, where if the United States were to invade, we would be at world war. Well, that's essentially what we're doing here. By keeping an open door, quote unquote, with Ukraine to be added to NATO, that we're threatening them. That is a that is a a red line that they're not willing to accept, and I don't think that the United States would accept it either. So, whatever you feel about Putin, I think that that's a reasonable stance to take. I wouldn't want to have a neighboring country that's in an alliance with someone six thousand miles away that has nuclear weapons. That if we were to get into a conflict with our neighbor, now all of a sudden I have nukes flying at me. And that's essentially what Putin has been saying. A completely reasonable stance to take. I don't care who you are. You have to admit that's a reasonable stance to take. And don't take my word for it. Here's probably the preeminent geopolitical analyst, Mr. Mearsheimer, explaining in 2015 that this was a red line. What's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And I believe that the policy that I'm advocating, which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side, is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We're encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this and the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. And it's not just John Mearsheimer who had been saying that seven years ago. It is basically every prominent politician in America over that period, other than the you know, war hawk lunatics like John McCain, Lindsey Graham, et cetera, et cetera, who were over there basically encouraging exactly what John Mearsheimer was warning against, which was this is inevitably going to lead to war. Your fight is our fight. 2017 will be the year of offense. All of us will go back to Washington and we will push the case against Russia. Enough of a Russian aggression. It is time for them to pay a heavier price. I believe you will win. I am convinced you will win and we will do everything we can to provide you with what you need to win. This is the war that they wanted. I don't know how much clearer it can be. There is a divide within our government, fortunately, in that there are some politicians and interests, political interests, as well as business interests, that were interested in this war occurring. I think that's quite clear at this point. Fortunately, it appears that there are some thought leaders that recognize this risk and did not want this. 
And unfortunately, they have not been listened to. And that's why we're listening to them today. This is a thread by Arnaud Bertrand. He says, most fascinating thing about the Ukraine war is the sheer number of top strategic thinkers who warned for years that it was coming if we continued down the same path. No one listened to them, and here we are. Small compilation thread of these warnings from Kissinger to Mearsheimer. I already played you Mearsheimer, but I'm going to read you some of these, uh, just the snippets. The first one is George Kennan, arguably America's greatest ever foreign policy strategist, the architect of the U.S. Cold War strategy. As soon as 1998, he warned that NATO expansion was a, quote, tragic mistake that ought to ultimately provoke a, quote, bad reaction from Russia. Continuing on, Kissinger in 2014, the peacenik that he is, he warned that, quote, to Russia, Ukraine can never be just a foreign country, end quote, and that the West therefore needs a policy that is aimed at, quote, reconciliation. He was also adamant that Ukraine should not join NATO. This is Jack F. Matlock Jr., U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991, warning in 1997 that NATO expansion was, quote, the most profound strategic blunder, encouraging a chain of events that could produce the most serious security threat since the Soviet Union collapsed, end quote. Continuing on, this is Clinton's Defense Secretary, William Perry, explaining in his memoir that to him, NATO enlargement is the cause of the, quote, the rupture in relations with Russia, end quote, and that in 1996, he was so opposed to it that, quote, in the strength of my conviction, I considered resigning, end quote, keeping in mind that we then proceeded to expand NATO all the way up to Russia's border. So he probably should have resigned. Noam Chomsky in 2015 saying that, quote, the idea that Ukraine might join a Western military alliance would be quite unacceptable to any Russian leader, end quote, and that Ukraine's desire to join NATO is not protecting Ukraine, it is threatening Ukraine with major war. I'm not going to play it because Chomsky's voice is so grating, <laughs> but you get the idea. Stephen Cohen, a famed scholar of Russian studies, warning in 2014 that if we move NATO forces towards Russia's border, it's obviously going to militarize the situation and Russia will not back off. This is existential. I'll play you this one. Uh, if we move the forces, NATO forces, including American troops, uh, to toward Russia's borders, uh, where will we be then? I mean, it's obviously going to militarize the situation and therefore raise the danger of war. And I think it's important to emphasize, though I regret saying this, Russia will not back off. This is existential. Too much has happened. Putin, and it's not just Putin. We seem to think Putin runs the whole of the universe. He has a political class. That political class has opinions. Public support is running overwhelmingly in favor of Russian policy. Putin will compromise at these negotiations, but he will not back off if confronted militarily. He will Seems pretty clear to me. Continuing on, this is famous Russian-American journalist Vladimir Posner in 2018, who says that NATO expansion in Ukraine is unacceptable to the Russian, that there has to be a compromise where, quote, Ukraine guaranteed will not become a member of NATO. I think you get the point. I could continue on and on. Look, <laughs> it's quite obvious. I have already explained the logic behind it. You now have tons of geopolitical commentators and analysts and some of the most bright minds in that field that are confirming the same thing. It was a red line. It's a reasonable red line to hold. It was a red line. They made it explicit. So have I scared you enough about World War III yet? <laughs> I'm pretty nervous myself. Well, now might be a good time to consider expatriation. Just saying. <laughs> I, certainly, I hope it's not necessary, but it might be worth considering. And if you want to learn a little bit more about it, you have a free option to do so. It's Expat Money Summit. They are our sponsor. They're an upcoming online summit by my friend, Mikkel Thorup, who's been on the show. He's the, the man behind expatmoney.com with over 30 experts who are focused on moving your life, business, and wealth offshore. It's free to attend. Go to expatmoneysummit.com. Reclaim your freedom from chaos and uncertainty. They're going to have a litany of incredible speakers that will give you both the understanding as to what the expatriation uh, process entails, what countries you might want to want to consider, how it fits with your lifestyle. Uh, basically, it gives you a plan B, man. And I think it's probably worth having a plan B right about now. So it's coming up. For, uh, I think it's the second week of November, actually. It's a four-day event, totally free. Dr. Ron Paul was just added to the lineup. It's going to be must-see stuff. 
Register for free over at expatmoneysummit.com. This is your way to fight back against what is happening in the world. Stand up, protect yourself, and find out how to secure your new life abroad. Again, register for free at expatmoneysummit.com. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, sure, Clint, this is what the United States wanted, but it's not as if they were actually on the ground doing anything to make this come about. So like, can we really blame them? Like if this is what the Ukrainian people wanted and we just supported them in it, okay, you know? I mean, I've already disproven the fact that this is what the Ukrainian people wanted, but setting that aside, just pretend as if it were the case. Did we actually do anything to prepare, say the Ukrainian military to fight this war or provoke it for that matter? Well, unfortunately, yes. This is from March of 2022 in The Intercept. The United States intelligence involvement in Ukraine has also included a secret CIA training program, Yahoo News reported on Wednesday. Under the program, following Russia's annexation of Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula in 2014, a small group of CIA paramilitary officers were sent into the country to train Ukrainians in the use of Javelin anti-tank missiles, sniper techniques, and covert communications. The report noted that the Biden administration had since ended the program following concerns that its authorities might be too broad and pulled all CIA personnel out of Ukraine last month under the threat of Russian invasion. Along similar lines, The Intercept reported last week that shortly after Biden's inauguration, his CIA director, William Burns, sought to temporarily halt certain covert operations re related to Russia that U.S. officials considered risky or provocative. So you're thinking to yourself, well, I mean, that's bad, but we got out after the invasion. So, you know, they're doing the right thing. They got out so that we don't have American troops there that if they were to accidentally get killed or intentionally get killed for that matter, uh, it wouldn't be, you know, justification for us then to engage in an all out hot war between two nuclear powers, which no one ever wins. So let's see if that's the case, right? Well, it turns out it's not. When it became clear that the agency's prediction of a rapid Russian victory had been wrong, the Biden administration sent the clandestine assets that had been pulled out of Ukraine back into the country. The military and intelligence officials said, one U.S. official insisted that the CIA only conducted a partial withdrawal of its assets when the war began and that the agency, quote, never completely left, end quote. Yet clandestine American operations inside Ukraine are now far more extensive than they were early in the war. When U.S. intelligence officials were fearful that Russia would steamroll over the Ukrainian army, there is a much larger presence of both CIA and U.S. special operation personnel and resources in Ukraine than there were at the time of the Russian invasion in February, several current and former intelligence officials told The Intercept. Secret U.S. operations inside Ukraine are being conducted under a presidential covert action finding finding current and former officials said the finding indicates that the president has quietly notified certain congressional leaders about the administration's decision to conduct a broad program of clandestine operations inside the country one former special forces officer said that biden amended a pre-existing finding originally approved during the obama administration that was designed to counter malign foreign influence activities a former cia officer told the intercept that biden's use of pre-existing finding has frustrated some intelligence officials who believe that u.s involvement in the ukraine conflict differs so much from the spirit of the finding that it should merit a new one yeah well wouldn't that be nice but that's not how it works we don't do that so it's unfortunate right so we have cia operatives that are in ukraine right now not to mention we're also using our drones on the border of Ukraine to give them intel. Now, allegedly, we're not feeding it to them in real time and that it is finished intelligence, which simply means that we take it in, we process it, and then we relay it to the Ukrainian military. So, you know, we get to basically dictate what they get to see and what they don't. I don't know if that makes it better or worse, to be honest, um, but that's allegedly what we're doing. Uh, not to mention the fact that we've now armed them and funded them and kept their military and their government functioning with our taxpaying dollars. Uh, also, we're giving them kamikaze drones from what I've read, or at least that was the, the most recent proposal. I don't know if it actually occurred. I mean, it's it's an obvious proxy war. I, I, don't, I don't know how you can come to any other conclusion. This is a proxy war between the two biggest nuclear powers on the planet. Did you get to vote on that? I sure didn't.
are they even conveying that to the American people in an intelligible fashion so that we can decide if this is something that we want? No. Is Congress voting on, you know, an actual declaration of war? No. They're just arming these guys and funding them and doing everything else I've already laid out uh, without any sort of debate, really. It's like 80 plus percent, I think, of, of Congress that rubber stamps all of these supplemental bills to, to fund them. I don't like it. I, I, sorry, I said I wouldn't give my opinion too much and I'll, I'll try and stop, but I got to be honest with you. You know, I feel like I'm being robbed to dig my own grave potentially. And that's disconcerting to me, <laughs> to put it bluntly, uh, to put it softly. It's fucking infuriating if I'm being honest. And I don't understand why there isn't more outrage. And I think that ultimately the reason, reason there's not more outrage is because so many people don't have any clue about anything that I've conveyed to you this evening. And that's tragic because, you know, whether some of this information may be off a little bit, I assure you, based off of looking at tons of other sources, I've spent dozens of hours doing this research to try and present it to you in a really uh, concise but accurate fashion. And the truth is most people just don't know. They just flat don't know. And if you come out and you say any of this, you're automatically labeled as a, you know, Putin sympathizing, Russian loving, blah, 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 blah. And honestly, like, you know, aside from the Putin sympathizing, which I don't really have any sympathy for him, I do love the Russian people. And for the record, I do love the Ukrainian people too. My goal here is in ending this war and in preventing it escalating into World War III. Why that's a outlying radical position to hold, I will never understand. It, it seems like the only rational adult vantage point on this. Do you want to risk nuclear war, all out nuclear war? Well, hell no. Who does, right? Do you want to risk World War III, where we've already seen what the world wars amount to? Millions of, of dead and millions of innocent dead, too. The answer is a clear no from me. So I'm just trying to lay it out here so that you guys could at least take this in. You know, even if you don't believe all of it, take it in and weigh it against the other shit that you're hearing. Completely unprovoked. War of aggression. Terrorist Putin. Is it that simple? Now, I'm not justifying what he's doing, but is it that simple? It's not that simple. So it has been said that there have been peace negotiations that have occurred between, obviously not between America and Russia, even though this is a proxy war and we ought to be uh, picking up the phone and trying to negotiate a peace. We haven't. We've been radio silent, which is an absolute crime against humanity as far as I'm concerned. Setting that aside, there has been negotiations throughout this war periodically between the Ukrainians and the Russians. And allegedly, very early in this war, there was a fruitful discussion that appeared to have had the at least general parameters for peace laid out. This is another explanation of what transpired with that from Aaron Maté, who's the only reporter I can find that does anything really high quality on this stuff. But the article says, the claim originated with sources close to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who described the episode to Ukrainian media outlet Ukrainska Pravda. According to their accounts, talks between Ukraine and Russia collapsed after then UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited Kiev in April and informed Zelensky that Putin, quote, should be pressured, not negotiated with, end quote. Johnson also relayed that, quote, even if Ukraine is ready to sign some agreements on security guarantees with Putin, end quote, Western nations, quote, are not, end quote. That report was followed this month by an overlooked disclosure from former White House Russia expert Fiona Hill, citing, quote, multiple former senior U.S. officials, end quote. Hill wrote that, quote, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators appeared to have tentatively agreed on the outlines of a negotiated interim settlement in April. Russia would withdraw to its pre-invasion position while Ukraine would pledge not to join NATO and instead receive security guarantees from a number of countries. If the Ukrainian Pravda account is accurate, then it was the UK's Johnson presumably, presumably acting at the behest of the US that undermined this agreement. Does that sound probably like what happened? I mean, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened because obviously it has to, you have to connect some 
some dots and you have to rely on some unnamed sources here, but it's at least believable, right? So given that our government and our political class has basically taken the stance of no negotiation and Russia just has to leave. That's how, that's the only way this war ends. Um, it seems like it sounds as if they are not open to a peaceful negotiation between Ukraine and Russia to resolve this. They are escalating it infinitely and indefinitely and catastrophically. And it's very, very concerning to me. So I just wanted you guys to at least hear that, that there's, there was allegedly a, a general guidelines by which there may have been peace within the first few months of this war. And uh, unfortunately, Boris Johnson, who recently stepped down, I find that interesting too. Um, it was, it was put off. Tragic. Now, unfortunately, there's another layer to this that has to be at least considered. First off, Hunter Biden has now been investigated by the FBI thoroughly. It appears that they are doing what I would consider a limited hangout where it looks as if they may press charges against him for uh, gun crimes and some tax evasion stuff, but they're not going to go after him for the corruption of trading off of his father's name in Ukraine, nor are they digging any deeper on the 10% for the big guy line. Now, if you're not familiar with that, you can check out Tar Tucker Carlson's interview where uh, one of their business associates, uh, Bobolinsky, <laughs> I know that name doesn't actually sound like a very reputable source, but at least the information he's presented has not been disproven in that there was text between he and Hunter Biden where they referred to their business dealings and they say that, you know, the, the silent partner, 10% for the big guy, implying quite strongly that it was Joe Biden himself. So if he is doing multi-billion dollar contracts in Ukraine and in China for that record, for the record, uh, where his father at the time, the vice president of the United States, and now the president of the United States was receiving 10% of millions of dollars that his son was receiving. Well, that's newsworthy if I do say so myself. So you might wonder, Okay, but what leverage was Biden in turn applying to the Ukrainian government back then? Well, don't take my word for it. You can listen to Joe Biden describe it himself. And, uh, I said, I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid at the time. Now, first off, he's talking in front of the Council on Foreign Relations. I think it's absolutely hilarious that he's so open and honest about this. Um, and, you know, you could argue that it's because it was benign. Uh, many people of the more blue-pilled variety, in my opinion, uh, believe that that prosecutor was, in fact, corrupt. Now, it's been rumored that that prosecutor was, in fact, investigating the Biden's dealings there. So I can't come to any conclusion one way or the other, but I think that the fact that his son is put on to the board of gas companies, it, which he has no knowledge of, and he receives millions of dollars in compensation by being a member of the board. And do you think that they did that for nothing? Just because it's good PR to have, you know, the vice president's son on their board? Or do you think that they were expecting some political favors? I mean, use your head here. What do you think? I won't even, I won't even tell you what I think. What do you think? I think the answer is pretty clear. And... Since that prosecutor was fired and Biden is on tape admitting that he withheld a billion dollars in aid. So he's basically using the, the carrot and stick philosophy and that carrot being our tax money. Uh, that's pretty disconcerting, once again, putting it mildly. And I think that that's reason for serious questioning. Now, consider this. A few years later we have a different president in power. And his name 
you probably already forgotten it. It's Donald Trump. And Donald Trump calls up the, uh, the Ukrainians and he says, hey, I want you guys to investigate the Biden's dealings there. And he gets a deep investigation into exactly what happened. And it turns out that they were corrupt and the Bidens are now in prison. No, that's not what happened. Trump got impeached for it instead. <laughs> now, you could argue that he had a conflict of interest. It's clear that he did. And he probably wouldn't have given a shit if Biden wouldn't have been, you know, one of his presidential contenders. So it's obvious that he did have a conflict of interest there. But here's the thing. If the Bidens were corrupt and they were trading on Joe Biden's name as vice president at the time, president now, isn't that worth knowing? Because I would like to know it. And as of today, we have no investigations. We have basically open-ended questions with very limited answers. And then they call us conspiracy theorists because we dig on our own to try and figure it out. And it's like, well, it's not my fucking job. Why, why is some retired mortgage broker investigating all this? Like, y'all should be. That's what the FBI is there for, allegedly. But no, they have to... They're too busy arresting, you know, people who protest abortions and shit like that. It's just lunacy. And I mean, they're forcing my hand. They're forcing me, a guy who has no business doing any of this, to dive as deep as any, probably any person in America to figure out what exactly has transpired there. And this is why I do have a strong opinion as to what's transpired there, but why I have tried to leave it aside because I want to present you the vast majority of, you know, the most poignant, important aspects of the story so that you can come to your own conclusion. And hopefully, so you can share it with people so that they can come to their own conclusion. Because I want this to spread. I want people to really be thinking about this. And it's not because I want you to watch the show, which obviously I do. And I hope you like and subscribe. And I hope you leave a comment too. Um, but rather, because this is life and death, folks. This is everything. This is either peace, which is good for Ukraine too, mind you, and also good for Russia, but also more broadly for the fucking world, man. Like, we need to think about this stuff. We need to talk about this stuff. We need to be honest about what's happened historically, currently, and potentially in the future. And I feel like we're not. We are not having an open and honest conversation about this stuff. And when you have all of humanity hanging by a thread, I mean, just, just consider for a second. One misunderstanding, one blip on their radar screen that is incorrect could lead to all out nuclear war, which means the end of humanity. That's a pretty big deal. This is why you don't want to be caught in an escalatory cycle between two nuclear powers, right? <laughs> I mean, this used to be common knowledge. This is why, you know, in the eighties, it was such a relief because for 30 years or 20 years plus, we had been living under, you know, the sword of Damocles where at any moment you could have had just a misunderstanding or a miscommunication or a provocation or some lunatic that, that got elected and became president or, you know, president of Russia or czar or whatever they called it back then um, and led to, you know, all out nuclear war then. And there was many close calls, which I'm not even going to retell you because I'm not trying to scare you any more than you probably are. But there have been numerous close calls where we could have ended up in nuclear war during that period. And now it feels as if that lesson has been completely forgotten, that the vast majority of our political class at least is not vocalizing it to the American people so that they can decide. And that's a damn shame. And that is an abdication of their, their duty to us. If they still fucking believe it at all, they should be telling us the truth that what we're doing right now has the potential to end in the end of civilization as we know it. And if, it, if, if nothing else, that's what I want you to take away from this. Or do you want to feel good or do you want humanity to survive? Because it seems like a lot of the, the stuff I'm seeing about stand with Ukraine and Slava Ukraine and all this shit, it's like, it just seems like you guys are just trying to feel good about yourselves. I'd be fine with Ukrainians winning the war. I don't really care, just to be perfectly blunt. My concern is my family. I don't want all of them to die. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to be totally blunt with you. I'm being real selfish here. I don't want everybody I know and love to die. In nuclear hellfire. No. No thank you. And 
that's why I think that it's important we understand this stuff. So I hope I helped you. And one more factoid before I get out of here. We got Kim.com <laughs> said, who blew up the pipeline? This is in reference, obviously, to Nord Stream. Uh, it says, Gazprom just released these photos of a NATO Sea Fox drone that was found right next to the Nord Stream 1 in 2015. The drone failed to detonate. NATO was caught red-handed and claimed the drone was lost during exercises. They tried it before. Go figure. I'm not going to read it all to you, but essentially there was a device that would have been very likely used when Nord Stream was attacked just a month ago or a couple weeks ago now. And that's kind of fallen out of the news cycle, but it ultimately amounts to the end of the cheapest supply line for you know Russia to provide oil to Europe. And it looks as if NATO may have attempted to do, do so seven years ago. Oh God, it's so concerning. There's so much more I could actually present to you uh, on all this. And I, I think that I've made my point, you know, ultimately, I think that I've, I've made a good enough case that you could at least realize that this is a very, very complicated matter. Very, very complicated. And anyone that tells you that it's just like Putin bad, aggression, totally unprovoked, they're lying to you or they're ignorant. It's one or the other. And, you know, for, for the average person, I don't even blame them. Like if that's, if that's the only news cycle you're in, uh, there's a reason that you feel that way. And that makes sense. I wish that you would dig a little deeper, but setting that aside, I understand your perspective, at least. For those that are doing a little bit more research, and obviously those that are watching this have now done a hell of a lot more research than the average person, I hope that you'll you'll vocalize your concerns at a minimum. You don't have to, like I said at the beginning, you don't have to come to the same conclusion that I have, that this is ultimately something that it's a proxy war that the U.S. has uh, instigated starting, I mean, starting 20 years ago, but starting big time in the, the Maidan revolution in 2014, leading us here, uh, you know, training their troops via CIA special forces, um, basically giving them the war that they wanted, as I've said, and this is the war that they wanted. But that's my assessment. You don't have to come to that same conclusion. All I want you to take away from this is, is this as simple as what you're being told? The answer is no. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you support, or if you want to support my work, if you think that this was valuable, I sure hope you do because I spent a ton of time on it. Um, please go to libertylockdown.locals.com and sign up to become a supporting member of the show. I am going to be doing an AMA over there on Thursday night. That's, I don't know, tomorrow night, two, two nights from now. I don't know, whatever day it is. I've been <laughs> up for days reading all this stuff. Uh, it's going to be Thursday this week. You actually get to come in on stream with me. We can talk about this. Uh, for those that are new and watching this, I'm a, fi I'm, I'm a finance guy. So obviously a lot of people come on to ask me questions about the insane economy that we're dealing with and investment ideas, advice, things like that. None of it's financial advice, but you know, we're just bouncing ideas off each other. Um, but that's your, your best opportunity. You get to actually come in on stream and we could chop it up. We usually get like a dozen people in there. It's really fun. And uh, yeah. Become, become a supporting member. Fuck it. Who cares, right? It's like five bucks. Money's worth nothing. Inflation's happening. Just give me five bucks. <laughs> LibertyLockdown.locals.com. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I will, uh, I'll see you soon. We're out. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go? As you guys know, I have had Crowd Health as a sponsor for the past month, and I will have them for the next couple months. Anytime I have a sponsor, I always want to make sure that it's a product that I believe in that I think that you guys could actually find value in it and could actually provide what it's promising. So I wanted to invite Andy Schoonover, the founder of CrowdHealth, on today just for a quick 20-minute sit-down where I could skewer him with the hardest questions I could come up with to make sure that this is a viable business model, essentially. And given my experience as an entrepreneur, I came away quite impressed. Obviously, if you're already a CrowdHealth user, or consumer, then you can uh, you can ignore this portion. If you haven't ever heard his interview, either with Tom Woods or Dave Smith, I think you'll find it highly informative. Uh, I definitely came away thinking 
very strongly that I'm going to be switching from my health insurance over to Crowd Health in November when open enrollment starts. So if you are at all interested, if you've heard these ads, if you've thought about signing up, this will give you basically all the answers that you would probably, you know, all the all the questions that you would naturally have. I think that they'll get answered here and give you a much, much greater sense of comfort with proceeding if that's something that you're interested in. As always, if you are interested in signing up, go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the promo code LOCKDOWN. There's also another promo code that we'll tell you about during the episode. If you're a Bitcoin person, I think it'll be tremendously interesting. Enjoy the interview. Welcome, everybody, to part two of the new episode of Liberty Lockdown. This is Clint Russell, your humble host, and I am joined today by Andy Schoonover. He is the founder of Crowd Health. Thank you for joining me, Andy. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, so I've, I've obviously, I've been promoing your company for a, a month or so now, and um, I only do so because I actually believe in what you guys are doing. But I think for my audience's sake, it would be great if they could hear kind of your underlying principles. Uh, maybe we could start with, you know, what the product is, and then we yeah. can go on from there. Yeah. So, you know, in, in essence, we think that health insurance sucks and we want something alternative. Uh, we want to build a parallel system with, to what, you know, what we think big corporations and government have taken over um, in one of our most important aspects of life, right? Which is our, it's, is our health. Um, and so, you know, a few years ago, I, I sold my company and so didn't have uh, health care. Most of us get health care through our employers. And so I had to go to healthcare.gov and uh, they just had a bunch of crappy plans, but I picked one. Uh, it was 1200 bucks for me, my wife and my two girls. And I joke it, it worked until I used it. Um, my little one was having, had a perforated eardrum. So she had to go to the hospital, get that fixed. And the, uh, it was 15 minutes. Uh, so a pretty minor procedure, but it was $8,000. And, uh, so I was just like blown away by the fact that 15 minutes could be $8,000. I, you know, it's, we'd all love that hourly rate. Um, and then I got a note from my insurance plan saying it is medically unnecessary they're not going to pay for it. Uh, you know, literally a hole in her eardrum that the ENT, ear, nose, and throat doc said, hey, she's going to have some serious hearing loss if we don't get this fixed. Yet uh, the insurance plan wouldn't pay for it. And I had to stroke an $8,000 check to the local hospital. Um, come to find out these healthcare.gov plans, about one out of every five claims are denied. So you have a one in five chance of the health insurance plan doing what they did to me, which is saying, we're not paying for it. Right. And so you go into these things thinking that you're going to get your health care bills paid for. And oftentimes that's just not the case. Uh, we have about 250,000 families with health insurance went bankrupt last year uh, due to a medical event. So it's like the whole point of having health insurance is if you have a big medical event that doesn't put you in a financial trauma. Yet we have 250,000 families going bankrupt, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. And so it's over the last couple of years, I've, I've started putting together uh, a set of tools that allow people to operate outside of health insurance to viably pay for their health care bills without having health insurance. And so I, I joke we're, we're delightfully uninsured. Um, and actually, you know, my, my big vision for this is to have a, an insuranceless world, right? A world without health insurance, because there's so many perverse incentives with health insurance that, um, you know, they're supposed to be our, our agent yet they make more money if our rates increase and they make more money if they decline more of our, our health bills, right? And right. so those folks are not aligned with, with your best interest or the best interest of your family. And so we at Crowd Health, like I said, we're just building some tools that allow you and your family to viably pay for healthcare without getting the, the health insurance plans um, involved. And, and the, the key component of this, just super quick, key component of this is doctors hate health plans too. And so we go to the, the health plans and say, hey, if our member pays in cash, will you give them a really good rate? And the doctors all the time say, yes, they'll give us a rate that is 30, 40, 50% better than what health plans are paying them just so they don't have to pay before, you know, they have to, don't have to deal with, with health insurance plans. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard the same. I've mentioned before on my show that my mom's been the director of a hospice for 20 years or something now, and, and she just constantly laments how insane the insurance system is the hospitals everything she's just like you have no idea how broken it is so um it doesn't surprise me at all to hear about your experience with your daughter's ear and uh and i'm i'm so grateful that there's an entrepreneur out there that shares much of my beliefs that is actually trying to create an alternative pathway and you know at the end of every ad read i do i always mention this is not insurance can you explain why it's not because it, it seems as if 
that is kind of the original concept of insurance is mm. collectivizing risk into some sort of a pool which we all pay mm -hmm. into and then from those proceeds the insurance company pays for the medical care so why is it different sure yeah we're all programmed to think that insurance is the only way and so you know we're really trying to go out and talk to folks like you that says there is a different way of doing that and so um i'll, I'll explain the mechanics on the back end and i think people will see how different it is from health insurance but if you're um, between the ages of six and 54, it's 175 bucks a month. It's a little bit more if you're younger, a little bit more if you're older. And we start an account for you when you sign up for Crowd Health. So you'll put that $175 into an account. We take $30 of that. That's our subscription fee. So the only way we make money is is subscription fees. And so you know we have an incentive for that that group to get bigger. We have no incentive to deny your claim or whatever. Um, and so. You have now have $145 in that account, and that is your crowdfunding account. So that account is being used to help everybody else in the community. And so if Andy, you know, breaks his arm and it's five thousand dollars, I'll pay the first five hundred bucks of that, and then I'll then Crowd Health will go to just say forty-five other people and say, Will you give Andy a hundred dollars out of your account to help him with his broken arm? And if you say yes, then money goes from your account to my account, I have enough money then to pay for my for my broken arm. This is all done on the background. So we're it's super simple and easy, easy to use. But the, the great thing is, is that's always your money. So um, if you leave Crowd Health, if there's money left over in that account, it's yours, you get to take it with you. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is not sending it into the black hole of insurance land where you never get to see your dollars again. It's it's truly your money. It's truly a voluntary crowdfunding of other people's, um, you know, health events. And so you may be like, okay, so why would I crowd hell you know, or crowdfund Andy's broken arm? It's not like it's childhood leukemia or, you know, something that really tugs at the heartstrings. Well, what we do is when I ask for money from, from the, the community, it shows my history of if I've helped the other community members. So if uh -huh. I've said, yes, 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 yes. You can see that and you can say, oh, well, Andy's been a good community member of the community. And so I will happily give to him. If I say no, 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 then you're like, yeah, he's, you know, a Scrooge. He doesn't want to give to anybody else. And so I don't, you know, I'm not going to give to him. And the people who um, don't give to the Scrooges of the community aren't, um, you know, deducted for that or not, <laughs> not, uh, you know, hit for that. So there's this this reciprocity engine that drives what we do. But given it's voluntary, you don't have to pay for it. Given Crowd Health never pools the money, you have your own money. It's you know almost like a decentralized you know uh, accounts. You have millions of dollars, but they're in thousands of accounts, uh, which is right. totally different than you know uh, one big pool held by an insurance company. By the way, given the current money supply in our country is is melting, right? Like you know, the, the value of that pool is is melting, and so you know, why would we why would we you know put our money into a melting pool of of, right. of and, and it's it's melting dollars. because they invest that capital, correct? Well, they invest that capital and they get the value in the, in that investment. So that's not going back to to the people who put it in. It's going to the insurance companies who are investing that money and they're taking the profits off of that. Right. right. So, you know, one of the components of what we do is we say, hey, if you want to put money in and you want to invest it in, in another asset right now, our, our other asset you can invest it in is Bitcoin. If you want to invest it in Bitcoin, you can actually hold a part of that money in Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin goes from what is it, 19,000 today or something and goes up to 100,000, 100 percent of that appreciation is yours. And so wow. instead of the insurance plan investing that those dollars, you get to invest those dollars and you get to see the upside of that. Right. It's a, the, the economics are, are totally different. Um, and that's why, you know, we have thousands of people now who've signed up for, for crowd health and are, and are really excited about getting away from that model and opting out of that health insurance model. No, I, I totally understand why, too. Well, I've heard that uh, there's a, a special promo code for people that want to be enrolled in the kind of the Bitcoin model that you just referenced. Is there something that my audience can do with the promo code lockdown that would allow them to do so as well? Yeah, um, if you go on lockdown BTC, you can do you can be a part of our Bitcoin community. If you just want to do lockdown, then we have a great promo code for you, which is ninety nine bucks, I think, for you right. know a few six months, months, six months, yeah. um, which you know is is about half off of what it of it normally is. And the the way that we can do this is that you know most of our members are in their mid thirties, they're healthy, 
their BMI is about five points lower than the national average. Right. And so that's why, and, and very few people actually use the service over the first six months. And so why are we having you put in money when you're not actually going to be using it? Um, so sure. that's, that's the benefit of, of being in a community of people who, you know, actually are, t are taking care of themselves. No, I love that. I think that, you know, just from a risk analyst in my prior career, uh, the natural mm. question is what if you guys grow and you end up, becoming popularized to the extent that you have some you know 60 70 year old person who's diabetic and has a tremendous amount of health care needs and they sign up is that it seems like that would be a, a risk that the pool probably could not sustain yeah some limitations um if you are over 64 we do not enroll you um and Got so it. you 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 know you're eligible for for Medicare, you know, I, I, I hate government plans, but it's we, we're not we're not we don't have the infrastructure to take care of, you know, 60, 70, sure. 80 year olds. Um, and and then we do not allow people who weigh over 300 pounds, um, 260 if you're female. So, you know, that's actually going to come down next year. Um, and so that's that's one other thing. And then the last one is if you have a pre-existing condition like diabetes or congestive heart failure or something like that then you are um, responsible or you will pay all of those for the first year. Um, and so, you know, that one is like, look, you can't just come in and, and throw a bunch of healthcare expenses at, at people and expect them to pay. Like you have to be a member of the community until you, of course. you know, allow people to pay. And there's, there's stuff like that happens, like broken arms and things um, that the community will help you pay for from day one. But if you're bringing something in with you, then it's only fair that you take, you know, that portion for a, a period of time. And so inevitably, if you have something that's super, super expensive, you're probably not joining the, the community. Um, if you're a member of the community and you so say you come down with diabetes or, or whatever it ends up being, um, we're still getting pricing that's about 50% better than what health plans are getting for the exact same doctor, exact same anesthesiologist, you know, it's exact same, you know, prescription drugs. And so we're, we're getting significantly better pricing than health plans. And that just shows that if you add some consumerism into healthcare, which right now there is none, we can significantly <laughs> drop costs. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think that's probably the underlying reason that our health care system is so broken is that they have disconnected the, the consumer from the provider. Like there's yeah. this middleman, their incentives are totally misaligned from both ends, essentially. Totally. And, and then you end up, you know, not getting any in any way what we really want. You know, we have skyrocketing costs and we have uh, decreasing uh, quality of care, it, it appears to me. Um, and it, it's just it's just tragic. And, and yeah. I think that this is this is one. Obviously, there's numerous other reform ideas I could come up with. But this is one great option as to how you can kind of put the consumer's power back into the system. Mm -hmm. Is that was that mm -hmm. a concerted effort on your part? Yeah, totally. You know, the system has been been structured to be a business to business type of structure. It's hospitals and insurance plans are fighting with each other, right? right. And and if you get a statement of benefits in the mail, you you can look through that and they're always like, "There's no way this was built by a consumer friendly organization." Like Apple would never send this to me because it makes absolutely no sense. You know, so what we're trying to do is make this a much more of a, a, a B to C or a direct to consumer play where the consumer experience is the top thing on the list, not, you know, what the health insurance has to pay or the hospital system has to pay or anything it's like we want an awesome consumer experience. And so that's really what we've tried to build. And I'll give you, you know, just you know, a couple examples. It's like you there's no reason for you to have to go into a doctor's office to talk to your primary care doc like you should be able to do it virtually. And so we have virtual primary care as a part of our, our system. You know, if something happens at home and you want to talk to a doc, you know, for urgent care, we have virtual urgent care. You can talk to a doc within 15 minutes. Wow. Um, and, you know, we're, we're introducing in about uh, 30 to 60 days um, virtual specialty care too. So instead of having to go to your primary care doctor to get a referral to a specialty doctor just to talk about something that you're really concerned about, you can talk to a specialty doctor, you know, right away about, whatever it is that you have going on in your life. You know, I just recently got, um, you know, labs done and there was something on the labs that popped up. I was like, huh, I, I wonder what's going on here. So I was actually to talk to a specialist directly 
via the crowd health platform to talk to them about like what is going on with my labs and what can i do to improve it and all all of that without you know exiting my couch you know like i can i can do that all from the couch which is a much more consumer focused experience than sitting in an er or sitting in the doctor's office or whatever it may be like nobody wants to be that that's the last place that we all want to be is is sitting in a doctor's office or a clinic and so we're, we're really trying to build a, a parallel healthcare system so that people can do the vast majority of their care virtually and only in the you know the situation we have an emergency or something serious do you have to actually go into a, a doctor's office so yeah uh, it's a virtual first option for us and we think like i said mid 30s is our average age like for, for i'm in my mid 40s but it's those late 20s 30s 40s and 50s that's what how they want to, to receive their health care now especially kind of post pandemic and all that kind of stuff it's like I just want to take it from my my house and and not have to step into an, an office or a, a hospital. <laughs> For sure. I mean, my my least favorite part of getting sick or having an injury or something like that is having to go to the hospital. Like, and and so often, all I really need is a consultation. You know, yeah. it, or. Or totally. a, a med. You know, I just need a doctor to give me a prescription for something or whatever. It's like, it's. Uh, and and honestly, I very rarely need the hospital at all because yeah. I, I am healthy and relatively young, getting old now, but. Uh, yeah. it's, it's definitely nice to have an option where it seems as if like the risk is being kind of collectivized amongst people who are more responsible and individualistic, which is kind of a, a beautiful hybrid of, of two philosophies. Um, just to throw out kind of a worst case scenario, just sure. to see how you guys would handle it. Say some young, healthy person ends up with some degenerative disease that's going to run up millions of dollars in, in necessary care over the remainder of their life. Would that be something that this type of plan could accommodate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that again, we're, we're getting pricing that is way better than health plans, including pharmaceutical pricing. So, you know, all of our members are, you know, delightfully uninsured. Um, and so we can actually negotiate with those pharmaceutical companies to get prices that are way, way lower than what, what health plans can pay. Cause you know, these pharmaceutical companies look at you and me and ultimately it's our bill, you know, there we're, we're at risk for these bills and we have a community of people who are, you know, committed to helping you. But, um, we then have the power to negotiate with big as pharmaceuticals if you're uninsured. Yeah, as if yeah, you're yeah. uninsured, cause we're, we are uninsured, right? We right, have, right. We have the power to negotiate with the hospitals. We have way more power than United healthcare has, which is, you know, the seventh largest company by revenue in the in the world. And so that's yeah. just the power of consumerism. You know, we've got well, and um, it's also the power of the fact that most I think it's I think it's more than half of uninsured people who get health care end up not paying the bill. So oh, yeah, yeah. if you guys offer to pay 60 percent of it, they're like, OK, cool. <laughs> yeah. Hospitals currently are getting about nine cents on the dollar from oh from God. uninsured and so we're coming in and we're saying hey listen we'll give you a 40 50 60 cents on the dollar right. and you know you're actually better off so we're actually helping the system right. not hurting the system they're like situation. we're miles ahead this is a this is a steal yeah oh, i mean we have wow. col we have a colon cancer patient we have um uh, an ovarian uh, cancer we've had brain hemorrhages where people have been in the hospital for you know weeks at a time I mean, and all of these have been been crowdfunded without much, you know, within you know a few days. Um, Incredible. And so it's it really does work well. Yeah. What what is the? I mean, the I guess the premium or or whatever the spread is that that actually goes to you guys who are running the organization. I would imagine there is some overhead in the negotiation process to. Mm -hmm to beat those bills down, do they call up and like represent themselves as if they are the client or do they say that they're a representative for the client? Cause it's not, it's different from insurance. So I'm just curious how it's handled. If, if that's not too inside baseball. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. So we, we actually um, do outsource that to another company and they're full of attorneys. So it's an attorney that's calling uh, the hospital. Um, and there's actually, there's, <laughs> yeah. And there's, and there's actually federal code that says that the hospital, if they have not given you a price beforehand has to negotiate. And so, um, you know, you, it's, it's like, you know, it's called the open price contract or something like that, where you have to, you know, federal law, actually it's, it's universal commercial code. So every state's got the exact same law that says you have to negotiate if you have not given them a price up front. So we, we, you know, give them attorneys to be able to go and do that. And if they're not willing to negotiate, then we will actually, 
you know, help them take the hospital to court. So, you know, it's really kind of giving the power back to the people, right? As opposed yeah. to these, these hospital systems and, and health insurance companies. And again, all this stuff is included in your monthly subscription. So we're not asking for more to negotiate. We're not asking for more to, you know, get attorneys involved. It's, you know, we're not asking more for these, all these virtual, you know, doctor visits that you do. Like that is a part of your subscription. And so it's just super easy to understand, you know, what your, you know, your subscription amount is going to be every month as opposed to a, you know, a health insurance bill or a health care bill coming in the mail. And you're like, I have no idea if this is $500, $5,000 or $50,000, right? Like, yeah. that's, well, that's I, the beauty I, of what we do. I, I savagely broke my arm in uh, New York City riding a bike through Central Park in 2012, I think it was. I have a, I have a picture with a cast with Joe Rogan, which is kind of a fun story. But anyways... <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyways, the the uh, I had two surgeries because they had one in New York where they had to base. I had a compound fracture. They had to put the bone back in my arm, and then I had to have another one to essentially put the arm back together once I got home. And my bills were fifty thousand dollars. And yep. you know, I was fortunate in that I had I had paid a tremendous amount to have you know very very high level insurance as a self employed person, but. Um, yeah, I mean the the healthcare costs are exorbitant. They are they are truly extraordinary. So I would highly recommend that people, if you aren't insured, please, for the love of God, look into something like this because it can absolutely uh, assist during uh, catastrophic times like that. I mean, I was a young, healthy person. I, I don't know if I've been to the hospital before or since, to be honest. But it was just like one of those things that catches you uh, out of the blue. And I think that oftentimes people who are taking care of themselves and are young and healthy uh, tend to kind of just feel like they're invincible and it's like if you're living a fun lifestyle even if you're super healthy you can just have something that happens um so i, I hope that like, people will like falling off your bike right like falling Ex off your bike in central park and <laughs> exactly. you know like, and and your other your other option is going to healthcare.gov which is run by the government right? right and they've got these plans that are four five six thousand dollars for the individual there are ten twelve thousand dollar deductibles for you know families and so you know, if you fall off your bike and you're if you're single, you're you're paying four, five, six thousand dollars of that before the insurance plan pays. You know yeah. anything, right? So no, for I crowd, did I did pay a couple thousand uh, yeah. deductible too. Yeah. So for Crowd Health, it's five hundred bucks. Like you pay the first five hundred bucks, the community, um, you know, helps you with the rest. You go into the hospital, five hundred bucks. You break your arm, five hundred bucks. I mean, just you know, it's per health event, it's five hundred bucks. But it's you're not going to walk into the hospital and then you know have a bill that's. Ten thousand dollars that you know nobody's going to help you with. You know we have this community right. of people who are willing to help you with it, and so far we've gone through I think twelve or thirteen hundred bills um, that we've been able to crowdfund, and um, wow. not not one. And I can't I can't guarantee it. I'm not a health insurance company. I can't guarantee it, or else the regulators are going to be all over my ass. But sure. I can't I can't guarantee it. But we've done a, a damn good job at, at crowdfunding these. You know very very quickly. No, it's it's an amazing uh, plan B. I guess you could say. And, yeah, sure. You know, from from my vantage point, you know, I'm paying as someone who hardly ever uses any healthcare or doctors or anything. I pay over 500 bucks a month uh, as a self-employed person, and it's just like, well, that would be <laughs> my deductible with you guys. Essentially, I know deductible yeah. is probably the wrong term, but it's it's just incredible how much more value it appears to be with what you guys are doing. Um, what do you think the holdup is from getting more people to give you guys a serious consideration versus? the old healthcare plans? Is it just kind of trend lines and what people yeah. are accustomed to? I mean, I feel like we've been, you know, psyoped into thinking that health insurance is like the only way that we can, that we can live life, you know? Sure. Um, and so it's, it's like, look, give, you know, health insurance plans promise that they'll pay your bills yet. They don't pay about 20%, right? Mm -hmm. One out of five, it's actually 18%. Um, we can't promise your bills to pay for your bills, but we're actually getting bills paid. Right. And so, you know, there's this barrier of saying I am uninsured that people like don't really like to think. But I was like, man, I, I think knowing your your podcast and I, I think your listeners are similar to the ones that we're on with like Dave and Tom Woods and things like that. Right. Like, you know, be the contrarian and be like, no, I damn right. I'm opting out of the system like this system is is, you know, pillaging, you know, our, 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 you, we, all of us. And so right. let's, 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 let's opt out of a system that's, that's pillaging. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of your, your folks too are, are, you know, crypto Bitcoin types of folks, just like, just like the fed is pillaging our money supply, like these insurance plans and the government are, is pillaging our, our healthcare. And so it's like, own your own healthcare, become a sovereign individual over your health. And that really is what fires us up. 
um, and and you know there's total freedom and and being able to 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 plan your own health care and not have a health insurance company tell you what you can or cannot do with your with your own health. That's 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 ludicrous to me. I couldn't agree more. And that that is the primary reason I was interested in bringing you guys on as the sponsors, because I was like, these these guys are after my own heart. Like you're, you're doing what I would have done had I had the foresight to think about this stuff. And <laughs> um, ultimately, I don't have the time to create any more businesses. I'm too too busy getting this one off the ground. So uh, thank you for what you guys do. And I, I hope people will give it serious consideration. I, open enrollment is right now. So I think, or it's if it's not now, it's very, very soon. Um, oh, go ahead. Yes, it's going to start um, in you know a month or so, but now is the time to start looking at this stuff. And right. You know, you can you can start crowd health now. You can start crowd in a month. Or you can start crowd health in six months. It's up to you. We don't have any of these dumb enrollment periods where you have to make a decision every year. It's a month to month thing. You can, if you don't want to, you know, don't like it for some reason, you can leave and you can take that money in your account with you. Um, and so there's very little downside to giving us a shot. We'd love for your your folks. And by the way, you're 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 full of we're full of people who are you know, liberty, freedom loving, you know, folks. And so I, I can guarantee that you're going to be in a group of people who, who, who have the same worldview as you are very, very similar. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's the audiences of, of yours and Dave's and Tom's and, you know, some of the Bitcoin folks that are our primary customers, about 75% of our folks, I think are libertarian leaning folks. And so, um, and those, those people tend to take personal responsibility over, you know, everything in their life, including their health. And so it's a good group to be a part of. Yeah. It seems like the community that, that I ought to be a part of. And uh, seeing as open enrollments in November, I will likely be joining you guys. If any of my, audience would, like, <laughs> if any of my audience would like to do the same, go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the promo code LOCKDOWN or promo code LOCKDOWNBTC if you want to uh, check out the, the options for keeping your, I guess, savings, your healthcare savings account in a, a Bitcoin type setup. It's a very fascinating concept and, and one that I think has tremendous prospects moving forward, especially as the healthcare system and the insurance companies kind of degrade further, not to mm -hmm. mention our currency, everything else. You could uh, you could really offset a lot of things with that structure. So anyways, thank you so much for joining me, Andy. Anything else you'd like to leave with the people? No, man, opt out, opt out of the system. We'd love to have you join us. Thanks, Clint, for having me. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you want to pick up a Liberty Lockdown shirt, go to toplobster.com. We are out. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go?